Everybody and welcome to Grace here at the Medina East Campus. We're so, so glad to have you here uh, and uh, really, really pumped as we're continuing in the second week of a series we've been calling True and False. And so uh, like Steve just said a moment ago, if you happen to be a guest with us, if it's your first time at Grace, we do just want to extend a very, very special welcome to you. Thanks so much for being here. And for those who are watching online, we also just want to extend a very special welcome to you. Thanks for joining us on the other side of the camera. And if you're watching online, I actually want to ask you to do me something if you could. If you would just put in the comments, where are you watching from? What state? What place are you in? Uh, we're always just kind of interested in, uh, in where people are coming from, so we'd love to hear that from you guys. But thanks so much for being here. Like I said, we are in week two of a series that we've been calling True and False. And if you are just joining us, uh, this series we started talking about last week, we said that it's actually based off of one particular passage of the Bible. So it's a four-week series that's based on one passage of the Bible. And the place that we We've been going is in Matthew chapter 7. So I want to go ahead and encourage you and invite you as we go ahead and jump in this morning. Why don't you get a Bible and let's open it together and we're going to go to Matthew chapter 7. If you didn't bring a Bible with you this morning and you're in the room, page 788 uh, in the Bibles under the chairs is where you're going to find Matthew 7. And then, of course, if you don't own a Bible, we'd love for you to have one. Okay, we'd love for you to take that as a gift. So Matthew 7. And here's, here's what we said that we're going to see in this passage. Believe it or not, this passage in this entire series is actually based off of a conclusion of a sermon. So this is a sermon series that is all built out of a conclusion to a sermon, which sounds really weird to some of us, but basically this passage is the conclusion of the, ma- the most famous sermon that Jesus ever preached. It's called the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5 to Matthew chapter 7, and we said that this sermon really contains within it the most provocative and the most profound teachings of Jesus, kind of compiled together in this sermon. And we said that the way that Jesus is going to end his sermon, the reason we're taking four weeks to talk about the way he concludes it, is we said that the way that Jesus ends his sermon is in a really interesting and fascinating way. So last week we talked about this. We said Jesus, rather than ending his sermon, maybe in ways that some of us who have heard sermons are used to, rather than ending his sermon with some motivational crescendo, or rather than ending ending his sermon with like some kind of heartwarming illustration, or rather than ending his sermon with five practical things that you should do with the message I just taught you, Jesus does something really, really interesting and unique. He instead ends with a series of warnings. He gives us a set of warnings. And these warnings all come in pairs. And so we started looking at this, and we said Jesus is going to warn us, first and foremost, about two roads. He's going to say there are two roads, one that is broad and one that is narrow, one that leads to destruction and one that leads to life. And so he's going to give us this warning about these two roads. Jesus is then going to give us a warning about two kinds of teachers or two kinds of prophets. He's going to say there are true teachers or true prophets and there are false prophets. He's then going to talk about two different kinds of disciples. He's going to say there are true disciples, true followers, and then there are false disciples, there are false followers. And then he's going to give us a warning about two builders. And he's going to say there's two ways you can construct your life. One is on a foundation of something that is true and strong, and the other is on a foundation that is false and is flimsy. And so he's going to give us kind of these shocking pictures that are going to force us to a place where we have to make a decision, and there's warning that's involved. So because Jesus, what Jesus is saying here is so shocking, we said we're actually going to take each week in this series and talk through each of these, these different pictures that he gives us. So last week, we spent the entire time talking about the two roads, and so that was last week. This week, we're going to focus on what Jesus says about the two teachers or the two kinds of prophets. And so here's what he says. Starting off in verse 15, Jesus is going to say this. He says, watch out 
for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit, you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and then thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit, you will recognize them. So that's a passage we're going to look at today. And you can see, just like, you know, at first glance, you can probably see there's a lot of things going on in here. And there's a lot of different metaphors that you're going to see intermixed. And so it's going to talk about wolves and sheep. He's going to talk about fruit and trees and all that's kind of going on. But the main theme, it's probably pretty obvious, is right at the beginning in verse 15, this whole passage is about prophets. That's what this whole passage is about, specifically true and false prophets or true and false teachers. Now, let me just say, I know, at least I, I think, that when I say today we're going to be spending a lot of our time, most of our time, talking about false prophets, when I say that, there's probably some of you that might be thinking immediately, you might be concluding, okay, what does this have to do with me? You might be thinking, um, pro- I don't even know what a prophet is. We're talking about false prophets. This seems like some strange, obscure thing that has nothing to do with my real life. Out of everything that we could be talking about that's going on in the world, we're going to sit here and talk about false prophets. And you might be thinking, this has nothing to do with you. But my hope is, my hope is that by the end of today's talk, that you will see that this topic is incredibly relevant to every single one of us. And I might even say this, I think especially in the time and place that we live today. This is an unbelievably important, important, important topic. And so Jesus is going to say in this passage that there are going to be false prophets. So let's just start off by talking about this. Maybe just to clarify, what exactly is a prophet? So if we're going to talk about this idea of false prophets, here's a good starting place. Let's first talk about what a prophet is. So if we're going to understand what a false prophet is, we probably better know what a true prophet is. So what is that talking about? The word prophet it's actually, honestly, it's a word we don't really use very often, right? It's kind of a churchy word. It's not something we typically kind of use in our common conversations with each other. Uh, but I think a lot of times when we hear the word prophet, what, what, what a lot of us think when we think of a prophet or prophecy is we think of somebody who can forecast the future, That's usually what we think of. So you might think of like maybe Nostradamus, a person who said that he could could, could tell the future. He made prophecies. Or you might think of the Matrix, right, where there's the prophecy about the one who's going to come. And it's like this future anticipation kind of thing. And here's what I want you to understand, that biblically speaking, when the Bible talks about prophets, prophets were much, much, much more than that, much more than that. So yes, there was an element in which prophets were able to talk about events that were going to happen in the future, but here's what a prophet was. Maybe here's the best way to think about it. Prophets were, in the Bible, they were spokespeople. They were spokespeople who represented God. They represented his heart, they represented his will, they represented his desires. Here's a great way to think of prophets. Prophets were people who spoke God's word to God's people in God's time. That's what a prophet was. And so prophets in the Bible, it was far less about, uh, f- about foretelling the future, and it was much more about foretelling God's word and God's will in the scenario that you're in right now. And so that's what prophets did. Prophets represented, this is God's heart, this is God's desires, this is what God wants for us in this time, in this place right now. Now, if you can get your mind around that, if you can get your mind around that, I think you're starting to see why this is such a relevant issue, why this is such a relevant topic, what's really at stake. Because here's what I believe is at hand. This is why I think this is so important and so relevant to all of us. I believe that in this life, and I'm just guessing, I'm guessing that probably 100% of us in this room would agree with this. And if most of us, if not all of us, probably all of us would agree with this. In this life, we need luminaries. We need luminaries. What I mean is, we need direction. We need teachers. We need leaders. We need people who are going to help us make sense and navigate our life to a place of flourishing. I think we all need that, every single one of us. I think we need people who have access to the vast reservoirs of wisdom and experience and insight to help us make sense of life and to help us navigate through life. I would say it this way. In our culture today, I think that we have many 
prophets. We probably wouldn't call them prophets, but there are many people that we would look to, many places that we would look to to find help and to gain understanding of how to make sense of life. So we might not call them prophets, but maybe we call them, like for us, maybe we call them professors. Uh, maybe we call them psychologists, maybe philosophers. For some of us, maybe we call them political commentators. Maybe for some of us, we call them pastors, best selling authors, musicians, business leaders, podcasters, YouTubers entertainers, you could fill in this list. But basically what I'm saying is, is we look to these individuals and we look to them to help us make sense of life, how to navigate and interpret reality. They are luminaries, right? They claim to speak on behalf of reality. They claim to speak on behalf of this is the way things are or this is the way that things should be. But here's the issue. And I think all of us are aware of this. They do not all point in the same direction. They often point in vastly different. There's mixed messages and there's competing messages that are often given by these voices that are pointing us all over the place. I think it's really interesting that this passage about false teachers or false prophets comes directly after what Jesus said last week about the two roads. So you guys might remember last week, this was the passage that we looked at. Jesus said, enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction and many enter through it, but small is the gate and narrow is the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. And we, say, we said that Jesus, last week we said Jesus actually presents us with a very different picture than what culture presents us with. So our culture presents us with this picture. The culture says there's a thousand paths, there's a million paths, there's a, a, a numberless amount of paths, and all of them are equally viable paths that lead to the place of human flourishing and human fulfillment. And so whatever you think is gonna fulfill you is fine for you to take. All paths lead to a place of fulfillment. Jesus is gonna give us a very different picture. He's gonna say, no, there are two. There's only two paths, and one that leads to destruction, and there's one that leads to life. Jesus is gonna give us a picture like this. He's going to say, there is a path, there is a narrow way that leads to life, and there is a broad way that leads to destruction. So it logically, if Jesus is right, then I think it logically follows that if there's only two paths that lead to only one of two destinations, there must only be only two kinds of teachers, only two. And so some teachers will lead to life. The Bible's going to call these true prophets, right? These are people who represent and point to the heart and the mind and the will of God, they accurately represent his word and his ways. You know, in a lot of ways, prophets in the Bible, they're a lot like cartographers. They provide maps and signposts that point to the life that God desires for you. But the Bible's also gonna say that there are false prophets. And false prophets, of course, are those who misrepresent God. They misdirect people away from his heart, away from his mind, and away from his desires. And you guys, this is why I think this is such a critical issue that Jesus has to warn us about. Because what Jesus is trying to tell us is this. Listen, not all messages lead to life. And not all ways of being human lead to human flourishing. And so Jesus is going to say, we need to be cautious. We need to be aware. There is false teaching. It's real. So what do we do about it? That's the big question. What do we do about it? Well, I want to show you today, I think that Jesus is going to show us in this passage that there's three responses that we should have, three responses. And here they are, and we're going to talk through them together. That Jesus is going to say, first off, watch out. He's going to say, you need to watch out for false prophets. And secondly, I think he's going to say, you're going to need to learn how to see through them. You need to learn how to see through them, discern it. And then lastly, I think he's going to say, you need to look beyond them need to look beyond them. So let's think about those three things together with the rest of the time that we have. So watch out. Jesus is going to say, watch out. In fact, this is exactly what he says. Look at verse 15. Watch out. Watch out for false prophets is how he begins this section. And I think this is kind of interesting. Some of you have different translations of the Bible in front of you. And if you do, you might notice that it doesn't say watch out. It might say beware. And that word that's translated beware or watch out in the original language is actually a very strong word of caution. It's a strong cautionary word. Now, this is what I thought was interesting. That same word is used seven times throughout the book of Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew. It's used seven times. And every single time, I just thought this was so fascinating, every single time, it is a warning about spiritual leaders. It is a warning about paying attention to spiritual leaders. And so this is a theme. This is a theme. And not just in Matthew. This is a theme in the entire Bible. I was reading one commentator, and I was blown away by this. I, I never put this together. One commentator pointed out 
he said that in addition to this passage that we just read, in the New Testament, there are at least 48 other passages that warn against false teaching. And today what we're gonna do is we are gonna carefully and slowly go through every single <laughs> one of these. No, we are not. I, I would not do that to you, okay? <laughs> But all I'm saying is, I want you to see this, you guys. This is not like some strange, obscure thing Jesus said. Right? This isn't just like some one-off thing that's like, we don't know what to do with that. This is a theme in the New Testament. I could give you an equally sizable list that comes from the Old Testament. And so here's what the Bible's gonna say. False prophets are going to come. It's not a matter of if, it's when. And there's a warning in there. And so Jesus is gonna say, that we need to be warned. Quick side note, by the way, and this is a kind of a side note, but I think it's important to mention this. This is actually one of the reasons why here at the Medina East Campus, we prefer to go verse by verse through chapters and through books of the Bible. And the reason this is this, is because a lot of times when we do that, the Bible is gonna cause us to talk about things that we wouldn't normally want or think to talk about. Uh, I remember talking to Pastor Dan Gregory. Some of you might know Pastor Dan. He is uh, the Norton campus pastor, and he is an, an incredible wealth of wisdom. And I remember one time he said something that really struck me. This is what Pastor Dan said. He said, you know, when you're preaching, he said, a lot of times people want to hear sermons on felt needs, on the things that we think we need to hear. And he said, that's good. He said, but the problem is not all needs are felt. I thought that is a really good statement. There are things that God's word is gonna bring up that we don't think we need, that we really need. I think this is one of those situations. I think this is one of those. I'm just going on a hunch here, but my guess is that none of you woke up this morning, none of you did, and said, you know what I really need to hear about? You know what I hope Pastor Tony talked? You know what the church needs to talk about? False prophets. That's what's been on my mind all week. I'm guessing none of you, with all of the things you're worried about and concerned, this guy back here is like, me, yes, me. (laughs) You are the only one. But I'm like, yeah, like all the things you're concerned about, the resurgence of COVID and the political landscape and the economic landscape and what's happening in your personal life and your marriage and your relationships and with your parenting and your kids and the Browns game this afternoon. Out of all the things that are on your mind, I guarantee one of the last things that probably went through your mind was that we were talking about false prophets. And yet, the New Testament and the Bible over and over is going to say, be careful, watch out, be careful. Now, now why is it that this isn't obvious to us? Well, I think the reason this isn't an obvious need for us is because Jesus is going to tell us false prophets aren't obvious. So look what he says. He says, watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. So now Jesus gives us a picture that's a little bit frightening. He says... um, He says, prophets, false prophets, are not going to be immediately obvious. He says, they're going to come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly, they are ferocious wolves. It's a terrifying picture. And you got to maybe get like a picture like this that comes to your mind, which um, that's a freaky picture. I would not encourage you to hang that in a child's nursery (laughs) if you you want your kid to grow up to be a well-adjusted human being. Uh, But... uh, but you know, it's, a, it's an interesting picture. Some of you know this. The most common animal that's used to refer to God's people in the Bible is a sheep. It's a sheep, which is kind of cute and sounds nice, but it's actually a little insulting because sheep are really dumb. But um, their number one predator is a wolf, is a wolf. And here's what Jesus is saying. He says, the false prophets are going to come to you. And he says, and they're not going to look like wolves. They're not going to come with a neon sign. They're not going to just announce themselves and say, I'm here to teach you false stuff. Not going to do that. In fact, what Jesus says most often, what they look like is they look like other Christians most of the time. The Bible is actually going to say this in a lot of places. Look at uh, 2 Peter. Peter says, false prophets come from among the people. There he's talking about the church. They come from among the church. He's going to say this. Paul says in Acts 20, I know that after I leave, savage wolves, he uses the same language, will come among you, from and among you, and they will separate the flock. From among the flock is what he says. They're going to come from, from God's people is where it's going to come from. In other words, false teachers don't announce themselves as spreaders of lies, but instead they claim to be teachers of the truth. And so I think what Jesus is trying to do is he's trying to give us a heads up. And he's saying, watch out. And I think what he's telling us is, listen, you cannot take every teacher, every spiritual leader at face value. And I understand the deep irony of me saying that 
where I'm standing here today, but it's exactly what Jesus says. So he says, watch out, but then he's gonna say, because of that, not only do you need to watch out, you need to learn how to see through. You need to learn how to see through them, right? So the question, I guess, would be this. How do false teachers give themselves away? If they're wolves in sheep's clothing, they're not immediately obvious, well, then how do you identify if you're actually dealing with a false prophet? Well, Jesus is actually gonna go on to tell us, here's what he says, by their fruit, you'll recognize them. So he says, you wanna know how to identify them? He says, by their fruit. And then he says, do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Now, um, this metaphor, you can see, Jesus is actually switching metaphors. So he was talking about sheep and wolves, and now he's talking about fruit. But what's he, what's he saying here? Well, what he's saying is, the way that you're gonna recognize them is by, is by their fruit. And then he gives us this analogy, do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? It might sound weird to us, But this actually would have been something that was very familiar to Jesus' first hearers. Everybody knew back in this time there was a really famous bush. It was called a buckthorn bush, I guess. And apparently buckthorn bushes had berries that when you looked at them from a distance, it looked a lot like grapes. This is what they look like. And uh, the problem was if you ate one, they were very poisonous. They would give you all kinds of digestional issues if you ate these things. And so these people knew this, that, that, that even though from a distance it might look like grapes, once you got close and you actually looked at the fruit, you would identify what it really was, right? which is that it's poisonous. I think what Jesus is saying is this, is he's saying that we have to examine the fruits, we have to examine the fruits of those who are teaching. You have to look carefully at the fruit. In fact, that's what he's going to go on to say. Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. I'll try to say that 10 times fast. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut off or is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruits, you recognize them. Now, do you notice the theme over and over again? It's about fruit. It's about fruit. So he says, you want to learn how to recognize false teaching? He says, you need to pay attention to the fruit. And some of you might be saying, okay, that sounds good, but what does that mean? Like, what does that mean? So let me help you out a little bit. When the Bible uses the word fruit, what it's usually referring to, or what it's referring to in other passages, is it's referring to what's coming out of a person's life. That's what it's referring to. And really, namely, it's two things. It is the fruit of your character. So what is the character that is coming out of your life? And it is the fruit of content. What is the content of your speech? What are you saying and what are you doing? That's what fruit would refer to. And I'm going to tell you, the Bible's actually going to give us, not just in this passage, but in many other passages, it's actually going to help us identify the fruit of false prophets. Now, I showed you that, that, that screen that had all the passages on it. We can't work our way through all of those. But for time's sake, I thought it might be helpful. Let me just give you four. All right, I'm just going to give you four consistent themes throughout the Bible of the fruit of false prophets. All right, so let me just give you a few. Here's the first one. The Bible's going to tell us false prophets... Here's one way you can identify them. They deny core teachings about Jesus. They deny the core truths about Jesus. This is a a very consistent theme when you read the Bible. In other words, if you want to identify if someone is a true or false prophet, the Bible's going to say you need to pay attention to what they say and what they believe about Jesus. It's very, very important. Uh, 2 Peter chapter 2, he says it this way. He says, there were false prophets among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. They secretly introduced destructive heresies, even denying the sovereign Lord who bought them. Now, um, real quick, uh, the word heresy, some of you maybe are familiar with that. Maybe you've heard it, but you're not quite sure what it means. So heresy is basically a teaching that's contradictory to one of the key truths that's found in the Bible. That's what a heresy would be. And here, Peter says, one of the ways that you can identify false preachers or false teaching is that they're going to introduce heresies into the church, specifically ones that deny the sovereign Lord. There he's talking specifically about Jesus. Uh, John says something similar. He says, who is the liar? He says, whoever denies that Jesus is the Christ. And by the way, Christ, a lot of you guys know this, Christ is not Jesus' last name. Uh, Christ simply means, it's a title, it means Messiah, And that means that he is the one who is sent by God for the purpose of saving us. That's it. So anyone who denies that, he says that that person is a liar. John's going to say this, don't believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they're from God because many false prophets 
have gone out into the world. This is how you can recognize the spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. But every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. In other words, what all the authors are going to say is you need to pay very close attention to what someone is saying about Jesus. Any teaching or any teacher that quotes Jesus and exalts Jesus, but does so as a religious guru or just simply as a good moral teacher or just simply as one religious voice among several other equally viable religious voices, a red flag should go up because it's directly contrary to what Jesus Christ and what the New Testament says about him. Uh, Any teaching or any teacher that denies the exclusivity of Jesus as the Messiah, that Jesus is the Christ, any teaching that denies what Jesus said about himself when he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. We talked about this last week. Red flags should go up. Any teaching that denies any any of the core aspects of Jesus that are laid out in the New Testament, So for example, things like his deity. So the Bible's gonna tell us in Philippians chapter two that Jesus is in very nature God. The Bible's gonna tell us in Colossians chapter one that all things were made through him, in him, by him, and for him. And so anything that would, anyone that would deny that, any teaching that would deny that, red flag should go up. Any teaching that would deny that Jesus Christ was physically, literally born as a human, God in flesh, Red flag should go up. Any teaching, any teacher or teaching that would deny that Jesus was crucified, buried, and then literally, physically, bodily rose from the dead would be contradictory to what the scriptures tell us. And I just want to tell you guys, a lot of times this stuff about Jesus, this, the, the, these little subtle ways that, that it gets tainted, some of it sounds really good and it's really subtle. I was actually thinking about um, an example of this. Back in the 80s and 90s, there was something some of you maybe have heard about. It's called the Jesus Seminar. And in the Jesus Seminar, there was one particular uh, uh, professor. His name was Marcus Borg. And he made this statement. And this statement had a tremendous impact on the church. This was the statement that he said. He said, the resurrection doesn't have to be real to be true. That's what he said. And here's what he meant by that. What he meant was, You don't have to believe that Jesus physically rose from the dead. You don't have to believe that in order for that to be uh, something that is true. So in other words, he said, you can take the resurrection as a metaphor. It's an allegory. It's 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 a poetic way of saying that if you put your faith in Jesus, that he can resurrect your hopes, that he can resurrect your relationships, that he can resurrect your dead marriage or your dead whatever. And And listen, that sounds good. That sounds inspirational. And there's even a kernel of truth in that, right? And yet, that is directly contradictory to what the Bible's gonna say. The Bible's gonna say Jesus physically, bodily, historically, literally rose from the dead. 1 Corinthians 15, the apostle Paul says, if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, this is a massive waste of time and we are to be pitied among all people. And so we have to pay attention to those things, right? That's important. So that's the first one. Here's the second one. False prophets present a different gospel. False prophets present a different gospel. We were actually talking about this passage in Life Group this past week. I just forgot about how powerful it was. Galatians chapter one, he says, I'm astonished that you are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. He says, evidently, some people, false teachers, false prophets, are throwing you into confusion and they're trying to pervert the gospel of Jesus Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let them be under God's curse. That's what he says. So, so here, Paul says one of, the, one of the clear ways that you can identify false teaching, false prophets, is that they are presenting a different gospel, a different gospel. Now, uh, some of you, if you haven't been around the Medina East Campus very long, you might be wondering, what is that? You're talking about the gospel. What is that? Well, we talk about it a lot around here, but if I could just give you an abbreviated, just kind of a, a nutshell version of what the gospel is, and we could say so much about it, but let me just say this. Here's the gospel, very simply put. The gospel tells us that our biggest problem is sin. Your biggest problem, my biggest problem, humanity's biggest problem is sin. It's that we have turned our backs on God. We have decided to go our own way. And the gospel is going to say our biggest problem is sin. Therefore, our only hope, our only hope is Jesus. 
Our only hope is the grace and the forgiveness that comes because of what he has done for us in his grace. Very simply put, that is what the gospel is. Now, here's what Paul's gonna say. Anyone who adds to that, anyone who subtracts from that, and then anyone who distracts from that, he's gonna say that that, that they are drifting from the gospel, and they are not presenting to you a different gospel. It is no gospel at all. That's what he's so, for example, any teacher or teaching that minimizes sin, that says that we're actually not that all bad of people, we're actually all pretty good, and God is just overreacting, uh, that should make red flags fly up. Uh, any teaching that says the biggest problem is not sin in here, but it's those people over there, any teaching that does that is drifting from the core doctrine of the gospel. Any teaching that says our ultimate hope is found in anything but or in addition to Jesus Christ. Anyone that says our ultimate hope is found in a political agenda. Anyone who says that our ultimate hope is found in a social agenda. Anyone who says that our ultimate hope is found in education reform, as good as those things might be, if they do those things at the expense of saying the only hope is in Jesus Christ. Those things are drifting away from the gospel. I love the way one, uh, one commentator put it, a guy by the name of Glenn Stason. I thought his words were so relevant. I want you to read this with me and read it carefully. Here's what he says. He says, all these teachings mean that we should beware of those who claim to be Christian spokespersons, but whose words tell us to give our loyalty to the ruling powers. They deceive us. We're to beware of those who claim to speak truth, but whose words try to persuade us to serve greed, war, and ethnic division. Now look what he says next. Pay attention carefully. He says, beware of those who put before us a corporate brand, a national flag, or a racial loyalty, or the almighty dollar, or an image of our nation that stands for goodness against another nation that stands for evil and inflames us to make war and arouses our passions to serve that image rather than serve God who is revealed in Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. I think those are penetrating and relevant words. I can I just tell you guys, as a pastor, I believe that over the past two years specifically, we have witnessed a new strand of false teaching work its way into the church that is new and is different than what we've heard before. And I think some of the things that we see in this quote are represented in some of those false teachings. And I just can't help but wonder if even right now, as we are subjecting ourselves to the word of God, and as the Holy Spirit is at work through his word, if maybe even for some of us, we can think back and think about ways that we have been deceived over the past couple of years into believing that our greatest problem is anything but sin and our greatest hope is anything but Jesus. I think the Spirit wants to work through his word to bring us back into what's true and what's right. Here's the third thing I'd say. <clears throat> False prophets exploit others for personal gain. The Bible's gonna tell us we need to understand the fruit and he's going to say part of the fruit is what comes out of their life. And he's going to say false prophets exploit others for personal gain. This is a, this is a major theme. Second Peter 2 says, in their greed, false teachers will exploit you with fabricated stories. Romans 14 says, for such people are not serving our Lord, but they're serving their own appetites. And so exploiting people to satisfy or satiate a specific appetite. I heard one person say this one time, and I don't remember who said it, and I wish I did, but I don't. So it was so good that I'm just gonna go ahead and take credit for it. So I said this one time. Uh, I didn't, no, but I thought this was really good. They said, some shepherds love the flock and some shepherds love the wool. And I thought, wow, is that good. You guys get what they're saying, right? So shepherds are like spiritual leaders. And what he's saying is some shepherds wanna exploit the sheep so they can get something out of them. They don't love them. They love what they get from them. I think that wool can be a lot of things. So for example, I think that wool, I think we all understand this, it can be praise and attention, right? It can, be, it can be the accolades that come from others. It can be being respected or exalted or seen as someone uh, who is like, you know, highly appreciated or something like that. I think the wool can sometimes be power. You know, some people like to accrue power. They enjoy being the big banana, and so uh, sometimes having a religious platform can give them an opportunity to do that. Uh, you know, I can just tell you this. I think a surefire giveaway, by the way, is if you have a leader 
who exalts themselves as the exclusive spokesperson who speaks on behalf of God. If you guys have ever encountered that, if you encounter someone who says, I have a unique relationship with God and I have a unique connection with him, in order to understand what God has to say, you have to come to me. I'm just gonna go ahead and tell you this. Don't walk, run. That is the making of a cult, all right? And then uh, I think power. I think financial gain, that's a big one, right? Exploiting people for monetary benefit. You know, I think we're all smart people. But you know, flags ought to come up when spiritual leaders have private jets, multiple homes, designer clothes. I just, I just think we need to be discerning about those things. And then, of course, lustful or sexual gratification. Gosh, this one breaks my heart. I don't think there's a week that goes by, unfortunately, that in the media we hear about another sex scandal from yet another religious leader who claimed to be representing God and yet was using that in order to, uh, to, to gratify their own desires. Yeah, it's so heartbreaking. And you know, maybe even for some of you who are here today, maybe you're investigating Jesus or maybe it's your first time back to church in a while and maybe you've walked away from the faith. And quite honestly, maybe part of the reason is because of the kind of crap that we see on the screen here. I just gotta say, that, that's devastating. It breaks my heart. And, and I'll be honest, a lot of that is deserved. That scrutiny is deserved. And so he's gonna say, you know, he's gonna say, we need to pay attention to this. We need to pay attention not just to charisma, but also to character. What's coming out of the life of a person? What kind of fruit is showing up? You might think of Galatians 5, the fruit of the spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Are those things showing up in a person? Not perfectly, but are those things showing up more and more in a person's life? The Bible is gonna say in places like 1 Timothy and in Titus, it's gonna say that when someone is in a place of any kind of spiritual leadership, you should pay attention to how they manage their own home. How do they treat their wife? How do they treat their kids? How do they steward their, and again, not per, nobody's perfect, but the Bible's gonna say we need to use discernment on these things. Here's the fourth one. False prophets soften or ignore unpopular aspects of scripture, and they appeal to popular preferences and desires. All right, this is a big one. False prophets, the Bible's gonna tell us, they oftentimes will ignore the more unpopular or offensive parts of the Bible, and they will cater to or appeal to the more popular preferences and desires of the day. So here's what the Bible's gonna say, Romans 14. By smooth talk and flattery, false prophets deceive. Second Peter 2, they appeal to the lustful desires of the flesh. I actually, one of my favorite passages on this is actually in uh, 2 Timothy 4. So get this, this is Paul. Paul is a spiritual leader, and he's talking to Timothy, who is a young spiritual leader, and he's imparting invite, advice to him. And look what he says, this is so good. He says, in the presence of God and of Jesus Christ, of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge. Now, that is a, that is a statement. Just look at that again. He goes, he goes, Timothy, in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who's gonna judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge. In other words, take this serious, Timothy. Write this down. And what is it? He says, preach the word. Be prepared, in season, out of season, correct, rebuke, encourage with great patience and careful instruction. Now look what he says next. He says, for the time is gonna come when people won't put up with sound doctrine. He says this, instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. Isn't that a great, isn't that a great word picture? To find someone that's going to scratch the itch I need to hear someone reaffirm the thing that I want them to say. And so I will go shopping. I will go teacher shopping until someone tells me the thing that I want to hear, that I agree with. So he's talking about here. So listen, I think any teaching that increases your faith and your hope in yourself and not in Jesus, your faith and hope in Jesus, I think a red flag should go up. I think any teaching, I think any teaching that reinforces your opinions but never challenges them or never steps on your toes through the word of God. I think that, that that red flag should go up. I think that any teaching that appeals to the changing times and not to the timeless word of God, I think that that should cause some flags to go up. Uh, one particular author by the name of Rosaria Butterfield, I actually love the way she put this. By the way, she has an unbelievable story. I wish I could tell it to you, but for time's sake, I'll just read this to you. She says this, 
She says, reinvent a Christianity that fits nicely on the coexist bumper sticker. Avoid the disgrace and shame of the cross for a respectable religion that bows to the idols of our day, consumerism and sexual autonomy. This manipulation strategy relies on using biblical words in an anti-biblical, in anti-biblical ways. It shares with biblical Christianity the same vocabulary, but not the same dictionary. I think what she's saying is really good here. She's saying sometimes false teachers, they will use Christian words. They'll use biblical concepts, but they'll do them in ways that twist and contour what it says. So Jesus is going to say, you need to beware. You need to learn to see through them. Before I talk about the last one, which the last one is very, very quick. It'll only take a minute. I do just want to say this, though. I'm guessing that you guys can probably already feel that this is a conversation that is very relevant, but it's also one that's very difficult. It's a very difficult one. This is not, as you could probably guess, this is not an easy sermon to preach for a few reasons. First off, because of the topic. It's not a popular topic. But secondly, because of my profession. It's not an easy one to preach. You know, sometimes people will ask me, I've been a, um, I've been a pastor for 15 years, which is not an incredibly long time, but it's also not a short time. And so sometimes people will ask me, they'll say, hey, do you still get nervous to get up and you know, preach in front of people. And I always answer the same way. And here's my answer. My answer is a resounding yes. I'm still, every time, every, I, we preach multiple services a weekend, every service. I'm still nervous. I was down here before it started. I was shaking. I shake every time. And I'll tell you why. It's not because I'm afraid of public speaking. The fear of being in front of groups of people went away a long time ago. That's gone. But here's what I'm, Here's what I'm scared of. And I'll just be honest with you guys. I'm terrified. I, this gives me nightmares. I am terrified of this. I am so scared that I am going to misrepresent God to you. Guys, that scares the crap out of me. I'm like, I'm going to have to answer to him. I don't want to get that wrong. And, it, and here's, here's why it scares me so much. You guys, I'm a messed up person. I'm a flawed individual. And here's what I know. Not every motive in my heart is pure. I wish it was. I wish I told you. I just, I have the best of motives. I like to be liked, believe it or not. Contrary to what I'm talking about today, I actually like it when people like me. I want you to like me. I'll be honest with you guys, it scares me. It scares the crap out of me. Because here's what I also know. I heard someone say this one time. I deeply agree with it. You know, I'm a flawed person, and I'm trying my best to tell you this is what God says, but I know I'm not going to get it right all the time. But here's the thing. I don't know when I'm getting it wrong. I don't know. So let's say, let's just say, let's be optimistic. Let's say that 90% of the time that I'm teaching you the Bible, I'm spot on, 90%. That means that 10, and that's probably pretty optimistic. Let's say that 10% I'm wrong. Now, I hope I'm not heretically wrong. I hope I'm not right? But here's the issue. I don't know when that 10% is happening. I don't know. And some of you are like, what are you telling me right now? <laughs> right? You're not selling yourself very well here, man. You know, here's what I'm telling you. Anyone who's up here, me or anyone who's teaching, you got to test what we're saying. Go find out. You got to learn to study it on your own. I'm not saying you shouldn't trust us. I actually really hope that you would trust us. But I hope, I hope that you would see that, man, we're flawed people. So that leads to the last thing. Oh, that's not this. The last thing is this. <laughs> so you got to look beyond. got to look beyond. That's not quite yet. So what do I mean by look beyond? All right, here's what I mean by this. I, what I mean is we have to keep our eyes. This is very fast. We have to keep our eyes fixed in the right place. Even though Jesus tells us that we should watch out and we should see through false teachers, that actually, what, what that doesn't mean is that this should not be our primary focus. What I mean to say is this. I don't think Jesus is trying to create a community. He's not trying to create a community of just a bunch of police who are going around, pointing at each other, and who are witch hunting. I don't think that's what he's trying to do. Uh, I was, um, you guys saw the next slide, but um, one of the things that this, this whole conversation reminded me of was this video game that I'm sure many of you guys have heard about. It's come out the past couple of years, the game Among Us. So if you have kids, or you have grandkids, you have definitely heard of this game. And uh, it's actually a, a pretty fun game. has a very simple premise. If you've never played it, basically the game is you have 
two kinds of characters, okay, that are on a spaceship together. Uh, some are crewmates and some are imposters. Now, here's the issue. You don't know who's who. You know who you are, but you don't know who anyone else is. Everyone looks the same. Everyone acts the same. The only difference is the imposters are trying to mess everything up and they're trying to kill you. And so the whole game, you're trying to guess who the imposter is, right? And there's a word. There's a word that came out of this game. My boys love to play this game. It's kind of fun. But there's a word that came out of this game that has just been bothering me so badly. And it's, it's a word that they use when something suspicious or something suspect has happened. What is the word? Tell me. Sus. 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 And so now, now everyone is walking around going, that's sus. That's sus. You're sus. That person over there, totally sus. Your shoes are sus. Everyone's saying everything. It's my, my boys. We went for a walk one day in the park. My 10-year-old son, this is what he says, I kid you not. There's a deer walking through the woods. And my son goes, dad, that deer is being so sus right now. And I go, like, it's in the woods. It's a deer. You're being weird. He's not being sus. Here's my point. I think what Jesus is saying is don't be like that. Don't just walk around now, look at it, that, what, life, what the life group leader said, that was sus, that was sus, everything's sus now. And what I'm saying is, I think what Jesus is gonna say is, listen, we don't need to blog, we don't need to bullhorn, we don't need to protest, you don't need to build a hobby of heresy hunting, you don't need to go out and build a website called shootthewolf.com. Don't do any of those things, don't do it. Jesus says, watch out. He doesn't say, freak out. He doesn't say, punch their lights out. He just says, watch out, watch out. We need to look beyond it. So what do we need to focus on then? What do we need to focus on? And here's what I think it is. I think we all know this. We need to focus on the real thing. Uh, one of the analogies I love so much, I've used it before, you've probably heard it. Whenever they train secret service agents to identify counterfeit money, you guys know what they do, right? Rather than having them memorize all of the different kinds of counterfeit bills that are out there, all they do is just one simple thing. They have them study and memorize the real thing. And if they can know this, frontwards, backwards, every single way, they can spot the imposter so fast. So where do we need to set our gaze? Not on false prophets. Here's where you need to set your gaze, on the authentic word of God. It's so important that you know it. It's, this is why every weekend that you're here, we put the word of God right here in the middle this is why we do things like the equipping division. This is why life group leaders are centered around the word of God. This is why when we sing, we sing these truths of God to each other and with each other. It's because we want to be a community of people that are centered on the real thing. I'm going to ask the band to come up. And as they do, I want to say one last thing very quickly to those who follow Jesus. And here it is. For those of us who follow Christ, in a world where there's so many mixed messages and there's so many competing and contradicting things that are being said, I think what the world needs more than anything is it needs luminaries. It needs people who are going to be signposts to God. And I think, what if, what if we didn't just beware of false prophets, but what if we became true prophets? What if every single one of us became signposts who adequately represented God's heart and God's mind? Let's pray. Jesus, thanks. Thanks that you love us so much that you'll warn us you care so much about us, you're gonna tell us when there's danger. And thank you that you've given us something real and something true. So Father, I pray that even in these next moments, help us to search our hearts, help us to look for places that maybe we've been deceived. You know, it's possible, it's possible. Would you help us, Lord? Where have we drifted from the gospel? Where have we strayed from the truth about you, Jesus? Help us identify those things. Lord, I pray we'd be a community of people it's not centered around a person. That's not centered around a personality. That's not centered around any of those things, but we're centered around you. So Jesus, we love you. And we ask you that in these next moments as we worship and sing, that you meet us here by the power of your spirit. Pray in Jesus' name, amen.